Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, this is Joy Work with Buddy Kasi, Rasmus Pa, and Ameya Wellinger. We studied skill computation in the so called anonymous model, which was proposed by Ishai et al. in 2006. This model, there are end users, and that is the analyzer or the server. Each user i receives an input xi. Using this input and possibly his or her own private randomness, each user produces potentially multiple messages. Here we use m to denote the number of messages produced per user. These messages are then sent to the analyzer who would like to compute some function f on the input x1 to xn. The distinguishing feature of this model is that we assume that the messages sent to the analyzer are anonymous which means that the analyzer can only see the message content, but not the sender identity. Equivalently, we can think of this as if there is a shuffler in the middle that shuffles the messages in random order before uh, revealing these messages to the analyzer. And this leads some to call this model the shuffle model, especially in the differential privacy literature. As is usual in scale computation, there are two main properties we need from the protocol. First is the correctness. We want the analyzer's output to be equal to f of x1 to xn. Second is the security. Here we use the information theoretic notion of security, which states that if we take a look at any two set of inputs, x1 to xn and x1 prime to xn prime, such that f of x1 to xn is equal to f of x1 prime to xn prime, then the distribution of the analyzer's view must have total variation distance of at most 2 to the minus sigma. Here, sigma is our security parameter. In this work, we focus our attention on the task of aggregation, in which each of the input x1 to xn comes from a field fq, and the goal is just to compute the sum x1 plus x2 and so on to xn. This task was indeed also studied uh, in the original paper of Ishai et al. For the purpose of this talk, we will state their result and our result in terms of the number of messages per user, which recall we use m to denote. In Ishai et al's paper, they provide a protocol where m is equal to sigma plus log q, where sigma is, again, the security parameter, q is the field size. Here we give an improved analysis, which saves probably a factor of log n in terms of the number of messages per user. So now our m is only sigma plus log q over log n. This result was uh, independently and parallelly obtained by Barley et al. using different methods. Furthermore, we also give a nearly matching lower bound for the task of aggregation. Uh, in particular, when the security parameter sigma is no more than polynomial in n, the our lower bound matches the upper bound up to a constant factor. Thanks to the reduction of Ballet et al., the improved analysis of the algorithm also translates to an improvement in the setting of differentially private summation. In this setting, each user has a real number between 0 and 1, and the goal is to sum them up. Here, uh, as a corollary, we can get an epsilon delta differentially private algorithm that incur an error of order of 1 over epsilon, which is nearly optimum, and a communication uh, of log of n over delta per user. Since this is basically a direct corollary using that result, we will not go into too much detail here. Instead, for the rest of this talk, we will focus on uh, the proof outline of our improved analysis and our low bound. We will start with our improvement on the algorithmic front. Interestingly, all the algorithmic results that we mentioned use the same protocol by Ishai et al. This protocol is sometimes called a split and mixed protocol. In this protocol, when a user receives an input x, which is just an element of fq, he or she randomly select uh, m minus 1 random elements from fq and send these as the first m minus 1 messages. Then the user let the last message be the input 
minus all the previously sent messages. The analyzer is extremely simple here. Just sum up all the messages over FQ. Clearly, the sum of each user's messages is equal to his or her input. Thus, the correctness is obvious. The bulk of the work here is in proving the security of this protocol. Isha et al. were the first to prove such security, and they show that the protocol is sigma secure when we take m to be roughly sigma plus log q. And here we show that we can in fact take m to be smaller by roughly a factor of log n. So m it suffice to take m to be sigma plus log q over log n. Okay, so what does it mean for us to prove such a statement? So let's follow the definition of security here. We have to consider any pair of inputs x1 to xn and x1 prime to xn prime whose sums are equal and here we denote their sum by a and let sx be the distribution of messages after shuffling on the input x1 to xn and let sx prime be the distribution of messages after shuffling on the input x1 prime to xn prime. Our goal is to show that the total variation distance between sx and x sx prime is small. Uh, here is not too important what the actual bound is, and in fact, we will not go into any detailed calculation. To make our life a little bit easier, let us also consider the uniform distribution on nm numbers from fq whose sum is equal to a and let us denote this distribution by SA. It suffice to show that the total variation distance between SX and SA is small uh, because due to symmetry, we also have that the total variation distance between SX prime and SA is also small. And by combining these two, we get the desired bound on the distance between SX and SX prime. Okay, so we would like to show that the total variation distance between Sx and Sa is small. How do we do this? Let us consider any potential messages after shuffling, and let us denote this by T1, so on and so forth, to T of n times m, where their sum is equal to A. On the one hand, by definition of Sa, Sa is just a uniform distribution over such Ts, so the probability mass of t in sa is just some constant here 1 over q to the n times m minus 1. So we only have to figure out what's the probability mass of t in sa. If we can figure this out then we can compute the total variation distance as desired. Uh, I copy some useful information from the previous slides here. Now to determine the probability mass of t in sx Recall that the messages are generated for each user, and then they are passed through a random permutation uh, before shown to the analyzer. It turns out that this means that the probability mass of t in Sx is just proportional to the number of permutations that could result in t or that is compatible with t. What does this mean? Uh, we say that a permutation pi could result in t or is compatible with t if after we apply pi to t, the first m element, uh, their sum is equal to x1, the next m element, their sum is equal to x2, and so on and so forth, um, and the last m element, their sum is equal to xn. For notational convenience, we will let yt pi to in denote the indicator variable of this event. We just mean that yt pi is 1 if all these equalities are satisfied and is 0 otherwise. Under this notation, the number of permutation pi that could result in t can be easily written as sum of yt pi over all permutation pi. Now recall our original goal that we would like to bound the total variation distance between Sx and Sa, and that 
SA is just the uniform distribution over all such T's. So what this means is that what we really want to show is that the probability mass of T in SA is well concentrated around some number. To prove the desired concentration bound, we'll use the Chebyshev inequality, where we think of the probability mass of T in Sx as a random variable when T is drawn from Sa. To apply Chebyshev inequality, there are two things we have to do. First, we have to compute the expectation of the random variable. And second, we have to bound the variance of the random variable. The two together will give us the desired uh, concentration result. We will not uh, state explicitly what these bounds are, but we will now outline how we can give uh, such bounds. Okay, so recall that we have to compute the expectation and bound the variance. So let us start by computing the expectation. As a first step, uh, let us note here that this expectation is just proportional to the sum over all permutations pi of the expectation over t of y, t, and pi. So it suffice for us to just compute the inner expectation, the expectation t of y, t of pi. To compute this expectation, it's useful to take a linear algebraic view of this problem. To do so, let us define the metric A pi to be n times mn Boolean matrix, where the ij entry is 1, if and only if the j message comes from user i. For example, if n is equal to 2, there are 2 users m equals 3 is user session 3 messages and pi is just the identity then a pi will be this uh, 2 times 6 metric observe that by definition of a pi and y t pi we have that y t pi is 1 if and only if a pi times t is just an all zero vector so what this means is that the expectation that we would like to compute, the expectation t of y t pi, is just proportional to the number of solutions to the equation a pi times t equals to zero. But the number of solutions to this equation is just q to the m times n minus rank of the matrix A. And it's also pretty simple to see that this metric is full rank, so it has rank exactly equals to n. So we can compute this expectation exactly. And this concludes the uh, computation of the expectation. Now we will move on to compute the variance of the random variable. And to compute the variance, it suffice for us to compute the expectation of the square of the random variable. And using the equation on the top, we can once again say see that uh, this expectation of the square of the random variable is proportional to the sum over all permutations pi and pi prime of the expectation over t of y t pi times y t pi prime. So again, it suffice for us to compute just this inner expectation, this expectation over t of y t pi times y t pi prime. Again, similar to before, we will take a linear algebraic approach to this computation. Specifically, we define the matrix B pi and pi prime to be the column-wise concatenation of the two matrices A pi and A pi prime, where these matrices are de were defined in the previous slide. For example, when n equals to 2, m equals to 3, and pi being identity and pi prime is the inverse uh, map, then uh, b pi pi prime is just the concatenation of a pi and a pi prime, and it looks uh, something like this, which is a 4 by 6 matrix. Now observe that for the product y t pi and y t pi prime to be 1, both of them have to be 1, 
and this means that a pi times t must be the all zero vector and a pi prime times t must be the all zero vector so this also means that b pi pi prime times t must also be the all zero vector so what this means is that this expectation of the product between y t pi and y t pi prime which is what we want to compute it is proportional to the number of solutions to the equation b pi pi prime times t equals to the r zero vector once again the number of uh, solutions here is just q to the mn minus the rank of b however unlike the previous case where the metric a was always full rank the metric b here isn't necessarily full rank in fact its rank uh, has many possible values in order to deal with this in our proof we have to give a combinatorial interpretation of the rank of b and using this combinatorial characterization we can bound the rank of b for random permutations pi and pi prime we will not have time in to go into more detail here but this bound uh, eventually implies also the bound on the variance of the random variable which is the last bound that we need in order to apply the Chebyshev inequality and this concludes the proof outline for our algorithm next we will proceed to the second part of the talk which is our lower bound so our lower bound holds again any protocol it doesn't have to be the split and mixed protocol and it says that to achieve a security parameter sigma we must use at least uh, sigma over log of n times sigma plus log of q over log n uh, messages and uh, as you might have already suspected this low bound uh, in fact consists of two parts the first part is uh, what we call the field dependent low bound so this is the part that says that the number of messages must be at least log q over log n so this bound hold even for uh, very weak security even for security where the security parameter is just one and the second part of the lower bound is what we call the security dependent lower bound so this is a lower bound that say that m has to be at least sigma over log of n times sigma so these two bounds have separate proofs first let us consider the few dependent lower bound so here we want to show that m must be at least log q over log n and we will sketch the proof here it will be a little bit hand wavy but it will contain uh, all of the main ideas to prove this let us consider any n times m messages seen by the analyzer since each message could have come from n different users there are n to the n times m ways to assign them back to the n users on the other hand these messages correspond to some output and from the security perspective if we look at two input sequences that correspond to the same output this very same output then the analyzer intuitively shouldn't be able to distinguish whether the messages are from one input sequence or another input sequence and for a fixed output there are q to the n minus 1 possible input sequences that result uh, in this same output however recall that there are only n to the n times m way to reassign the messages back to your user so this means that we should have uh, n to the n times m greater than or equals to q to the n minus 1 and indeed uh, this implies that m is greater than or equals to log q over log n as desired next we move on to prove the security dependent low bound uh, which say that if we want a security parameter sigma then we must have m being at least sigma over log of n times sigma so to prove this bound for general protocol uh, we need a lot of notations so instead for the purpose of simplicity of presentation 
we will only prove this low bound for the split and mix protocol here. To show that m must be at least sigma over log of n times sigma, it suffice for us to show that for each m, the security parameter is at most log of n times m to the m. Alright, so let's prove this. So what does it mean for the security parameter to be at most log of n times m to the m? By definition, it means that there must exist two uh, input sequences, x1 to xn and x1 prime to xn prime, uh, with the same output, in this case just the same sum, such that the total variation distance of the message distributions are higher than n times m to the minus m. Here it will be more convenient to use an equivalent definition of total variation distance in terms of distinguisher. Specifically, for us, it suffice to give a distinguisher that takes in n times m messages and either accept or reject, such that the probability of accept when the messages are from x1 prime to xn prime differs from the accept probability when the messages are from x1 to xn by at least n times m to the minus m. So it turns out that the two sequences of input and the distinguisher for us are very simple. Specifically for the first sequence of input x1 to xn, they are just all zero. On the other hand, uh, we set x1 prime to be one, x2 prime to be minus one, and the remaining inputs to be zero. As for the distinguisher, it just randomly pick m uh, out of m times n messages, and it accepts even only if the sum of these m messages is equals to one. The point here is that if these m, m messages are not from the same user, then the probability of acceptance is exactly 1 over q. On the other hand, if they are from the same user, in the first sequence of input, we will never accept it because the sum will always be 0. On the other hand, in the second case, if these m messages are from the first user, then we will always accept it because the sum is always 1. So we have that the difference in the acceptance probability is at least the probability that all messages are from the first user. And indeed, this probability is at least 1 over n times m to the m as desired. So this is the entire proof of the security dependent lower bound for the split and mix protocol. For the more general protocol, the main idea is still pretty similar in that the distinguisher will randomly pick a few messages and accept even only if those messages satisfy a certain predicate. However, such a predicate will have to depend on the specifics of the protocol, and we will not go into more detail here due to time constraint. So in conclusion, we give an improved analysis of Ishai et al. speed and mix protocol, and we prove an essentially tight low bound in terms of the number of messages uh, that holds not only against the split and mix protocol, but any non-interactive protocol in the anonymous model. Nonetheless, there are still quite a few interesting open questions. First, although we achieve tight low bound in terms of the number of messages, we haven't uh, got the tight low bounds in terms of the message size, or equivalently the number of bits per message. Currently in the upper bound, the split and mix protocol, each message is an element of fq, so to represent them, we need log qubits. On the other hand, the only low bound known is the trivial low bound, which is log q over m, where m is the number of messages per user. So it remains an interesting open question to close this gap. Another open question is more open-ended in nature. To the best of our knowledge, all of the non-interactive protocols in the anonymous model involve a summation in one way or another. So our question here is whether there are interesting non-interactive protocols or problems that are much different than summation. All right, and with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. 
Thank you very much for your attention.